Hello everyone and good morning. Welcome to Gurukul Lectures. Today we are going to discuss some of the general characteristics of archegoniates. Archegoniates were the first land dwellers of the plant world. Molecular systematics and study of cell structure tells us that more than a billion years ago, a heterophytic protist acquired an endosymbiont and a photosynthetic descendant of such ancient protist evolved into red alga and green alga. One of the descendants of green alga gave rise to a group of green alga called as Carophysians. Carophysians gave rise to a group of land plants also termed as bryophytes, tridophytes, gymnosperms and angiosperms. This transition from aquatic habitat to land habitat took place at least 475 million years ago. The lineage that produced were chloroacneophytes, a type of green alga which gave rise to land plants. Researchers have identified carophytes, a group of green alga as the closest relative to land plant. In this cladogram, you can very easily see that from caryophytes, origin of land plants has taken place. First, the early vascular plants have arose and then followed by first seed plants and then flowering plants. Bryophytes represented the earliest of land plants followed by seedless vascular plants such as ferns and uh, horse tails. It was followed by evolution of gymnosperms and angiosperms. Archegoniates were the first land plants. They are multiple, there are multiple morphological and biochemical evidences which suggest that how the algal ancestors of land plants were well suited to make the move to land. Let us understand some of those features. There are four uh, key traits that land plants share only with Carophysians, which also suggest a close relationship between two groups. One of the most common feature which is shared between Carophysian and land plants is the presence of a rose shaped complex for cellulose synthesis. These are arrays of proteins in the plasma membrane that synthesize the cellulose microfibrils of the cell walls. The other common feature which was shared between Carophysian alga and land plants is the presence of peroxisomes and the group of enzymes which contains uh, which is contained inside this uh, perox uh, peroxisomes. For example, enzymes like catalase, peroxyredoxin, copper zinc superoxide dismutase, magnesium superoxide dismutase, epoxide hydrolases, etc. These are commonly found in Carophysian alga peroxisomes as well as the peroxisomes of the cells of land plants. We have prepared a cladogram showing different types of flagellated sperm cells, one belonging to Cara, the other belonging to different uh, land plants such as equisitum, such as silotum, such as selaginella, lycophyta. So, if you could observe this cladogram, you will find that at the beginning of this cladogram, this uh, flagellated sperm of Cara is placed and then at other ends, there are different types of flagellated sperms which are found uh, some of the pteridophytes, some of the bryophytes. So, this presence of flagellated sperms in the species of land plants closely resembles that of Carophysian sperms. Fourth and also very important part which is common between Carophysian development and land plant development is the formation of cell plates during cell division which involves the formation of phragmoplast in both the groups. Now, phragmoplasts are tiny structures 
which are gradually arranged on the equatorial plate of a cell while the cell undergoes a cytokinesis. So, the pattern of arrangement of phragmoplast microtubules is very similar and almost identical in both the groups that is the carophycin algae and the red uh, and the land plants which have uh, moved from aquatic habitat. Now, apart from this there are many genetic evidences which involves comparison of both nuclear and chloroplast gene. They also point towards carophycin and particularly cara and colloquite as the closest living relative of land plant. It is also worth mentioning here that these living alga that is cara or colloquite they offer just a glimpse of what those ancestors of land plants might have look like or might have been like. Now, let us move on to various features which allowed uh, this transition to take place, which facilitated this transition from aquatic uh, habitat to land habitat. There were many adaptations which took place in these evolving plants. Now, for the convenience of study, we can uh, bifurcate these adaptations into two different types of adaptations. Uh, those adaptations which were already present in their aquatic ancestors and which enabled the plant world to move to uh, make this transition towards land. So, such type of adaptations can be one and the second type of adaptations could be those adaptations which were derived one, those uh, terrestrial adaptation which took place once the plant uh, ventured outside the aquatic habitat. Now, talking about those adaptations which enabled the movement of plants towards terrestrial habitat, we would observe that in carophycians, a layer of durable polymer called as sporopollenin prevents exposed zygote from drying out. It is the same one, it is a precursor to the tough sporopollenin wall that encases plant spores. So, here we see that this feature of uh, tough layer which prevents uh, drying out of early zygote or the spores, they were already present which allowed them to gradually move from aquatic habitat towards land habitat. The other set of adaptations which we call derived terrestrial adaptations. There are five different adaptations which we could uh, count which are most important ones. The first and foremost was the uh, evolution of apical meristems. Now, apical meristems are the group of meristematic cells found at the tip of shoot or root. These meristematic cells are responsible for the formation of different types of body organization. So, uh, origin of apical meristem allowed a compact body structure of the plants. The other adaptation which we could very easily observe is alternation of generation. Alternation of generation is one feature which got evolved as plants moved from aquatic habitat towards land habitat. Alternation of generation is basically uh, alternating haploidic and diploidic generation within a life cycle and both of them uh, re represented by gametophytes or sporophytes and they alternate each other in a single life cycle. The third adaptation was walled spores produced in sporangia. Within the sporangia, the spores were surrounded by certain chemical substances also termed as spore ornamentation or spore walls. These spore walls allowed the plants to with, withheld or to resist the desiccated surrounding. The development of multicellular gametangia, the development of multicellular gametangia also ensured that the 
female sex organ that is archegonium and the male sex organ uh, male sex organ that is enthridium they are more protected highly protective structures of gametangia ensured better chances of spore dispersal and better chances of fertilization the fifth and foremost uh, adaptation which took place while plant moved from aquatic uh, habitat towards land habit was multicellular dependent embryos now the sporophytic generation represented by zygote started dividing mitotically and these mitotically divided zygote now termed as embryos they are uh, encased inside a multilayered cell this multilayered uh, and multicellular dependent embryo ensured that the rate of survival of seeds is much more than the previous ones also this dependent embryo which was uh, surrounded by a jacketed layer ensured that they are provided some nutrition well at the time of initially at the time of their formation so these were some of the uh, adaptive features which gradually got derived as plants moved from aquatic habitat towards terrestrial habitat now apart from these habitats there were additional derived traits related to terrestrial life also which evolved in many plant species such as epidermal coverings also known as cuticle which consists of polymers called polyesters and waxes secondary compounds such as alkaloids terpenes tannins and flavonoids were also produced during secondary metabolic pathways now let us understand some of the features which these plants developed which were not possessed by their aquatic ancestors one of the prominent differences in the feature of a land uh, transition plant from their aquatic ancestor was development of a compact body now the plants plants can be very well categorized into shoot system and root system initially the root system was very poorly developed also termed as rhizoid but these rhizoids gradually evolved and gave rise to a proper root system whereas the shoot system gradually got differentiated into leaves flowers branches etc the second uh, feature which was possessed by these terrestrial uh, plants or the land plants were development of organs for attachment and absorption of water for the purpose of attachment and absorption of water plants developed root systems plants also introduced a specialized epidermis which are now directly exposed to dry air initially when the ancestral plants were under the water bodies their direct contact was not with the air so they gradually evolved and developed an epidermal system which is directly exposed with the dry air now these epidermal cells had some specialized cells for example some trichomes for example some stomatal uh, pores these places were the places of exchange of air the presence of these stomata and uh, um, uh, the presence of cuticle over the epidermis also ensured that the desiccation of plant gets minimized due to evaporation of water these specialized epidermal cells had pores these pores later on evolved into stomatal uh, pores they helped in absorption of co2 from the atmosphere through numerous pores on the upper surface similarly certain modifications took place at the lower epidermal cells the sex organs are now multicellular and jacketed so as we discussed the formation of jacketed sex organs ensured better protection of uh, male gametes 
as well as female gametes. Nursing of young embryo within archegonium or any such structure allowed better chances and rate of survival of sporophytic generation. Apart from that, now the plants have been exposed to very dry air. So, they have developed thick walled wind disseminated spores. Now, with the help of these thick walled wind disseminated spores, spores can move to a farther place. The dispersal mechanism has changed. The better dispersal mechanism has taken over from the previous ancestral mechanisms. They have also developed mechanical tissues in the body organization. As we will see, gradually we will have more and more uh, amount of thick walled conducting cells which we might discuss in our later stage in this lecture. So, <clears throat> apart from this, there was also a very uh, prominent change in the body pattern. Now, the body was dorsiventrally dis differentiated. Dorsiventral differentiation allowed only one surface of the plant to get exposed to direct sunlight and the other side of the plant is away from the sunlight. This also helped in minimizing the reduction of water due to evaporation. Now, amongst many of the features, let us understand one of the very important and basic uh, phenomenon which happened amongst archegoniates or these land plants and this is alternation of generation. Now, what is alternation of generation? Alternation of generation is can be described as the life cycle as we can see the life cycle of archegoniates alternate between two different multicellular bodies with each form producing the other. This type of reproductive cycle is also known, known as alternation of generation. The term alternation of generation applies only to life cycle in which both haploid and diploid stages are multicellular. So, for alternation of generation to take place, both the generation must be multicellular in nature. The two multicellular body forms which alternate in the life cycle are termed as gametophyte and sporophyte generations. The cells of the gametophytes bear single set of chromosomes and are thus haploid. They produce haploid gametes by mitosis for example, eggs and sperm that fuse during fertilization and these eggs and sperm form diploid zygotes. The zygote mitotically produces multicellular sporophyte which is spore producing gen. The sporophytes produce reproductive cell by meiosis called as spores which can produce a new multicellular organism also known as gametophyte. The alternation of generation continues with the sporophytes producing spores that develop into gametophytes and gametophytes producing gametes that unite forming the zygote which develop into sporophyte. Let us understand this alternation of generation with the help of a diagram. So, as we can see in this diagram, the alternation there are two uh, halves of this life cycle. One half is represented by haploid cells and the other half is represented by diploid cells. So, let us begin at point 1 where a gametophytic generation that is a multicellular haploid organism undergoes mitosis. The gametophyte produces haploid gametes by mitosis. These haploid gametes are represented by male sex gametes or the female gametes. Female gamete is represented by egg cells and male gamete is represented by sperm cells. So, these cells are produced after mitotic division of gametophytic generation. These mitotically produced male and female gametes, they fertilize and post fertilization they form a diploid structure which is called as zygote. Now, zygote is the first cell of diploidic generation. It is the first cell which represents a diploidic generation in the life cycle. Zygote 
further divides mitotically and develops into a diploid sporophyte. This process of development of diploid sporophyte from zygote is, uh, 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 is done with the help of embryos. So, for the first time development of embryo also has started taking place. So, a diploid zygote mitotically divides to give rise to a sporophytic intercellular uh, multicellular diploid organism. These sporophytic uh, organisms they divide few cells meiotically and produce haploid spores. These haploid spores are the first representative of gametophytic generation in the life cycle. And finally, these spores again divide mitotically to give rise to a haploid gametophyte. And thus, this whole life cycle alternates between a gametophytic generation and sporophytic generation, once again followed by gametophytic generation. And between two generations that is between gametophytic generation and sporophytic generation, the cellular division is mostly mitotic. When sporophyte gives rise to gametophyte, there is one place where meiotic, div, uh, meiotic cell division takes place. The alternation of generation can be of two types depending upon the morphological structure of sporophytic and gametophytic generation. It can be a heterologous or heteromorphic alternation of generation. A heterologous or heteromorphic alternation of generation is the one where the alternating individuals are morphologically dissimilar. They differ in structure and their physiology also. So, here we can see that the two generations are absolutely morphologically different. Whereas, if we could see the homologous alternation of generation, in this case the alternating individuals are morphologically similar and they resemble in structure and physiology also. Origin of and let us talk about origin of alternation of generation for some extent. The German scientist Hofmeister's great work on the higher cryptograms highlighted life cycle of different groups of plants and showed that several developmental stages and characters were similar in essential features in all the cryptograms. It goes to his merit that he observed that an individual organism is represented by a single distinctly recognizable cell called zygote which represented the sporophytic generation and the spore which represented the gametophytic or sexual generation. The two generations are integral part of the life cycle and remain distinct and recognizable. Way back in 1894, Strasburger also established the cytological distinction of alternation of generation. The sporophytic and gametophytic generations are the fundamental components of life of a plant on land. The gametophytic generation is considered older than sporophytic generation because the sexual process preceded the alternation of generation. This view is supported by the relationship between gametophytic function and the need for fluid water to provide an aqueous film for mobility. Then the question is, when did the first sporophyte generation appear in plants? There are two hypotheses which have been proposed as plausible explanation. One is called as antithetic theory or interpolation theory or heterologous theory. The other one is called as modification theory or transformation theory or homologous theory. In antithetic theory, it suggests that the first multicellular diploid phase or sporophytic phase arose when a bryophytic gametophyte developed an archegonium containing the egg cell instead, which on fusion with the sperm formed the zygote. The zygote divided mitotically instead of meiotic divisions to form the ancestral sporophyte and on maturity, a group of cells in this diploid phase divided meiotically to form tetrads of spores leading to gametophytic generation. As far as transformationist theory is concerned, it suggests that the sporophyte originated by a direct modification of gametophyte that assumed the specialized function of spores production. This theory is based on the clue that the life cycle of certain alga such as alva and ectocarpus have similar and distinct photosynthetic gametophytic and sporophytic generation. So, we have seen 
some of the very basic features of the characteristics of early land plants that is archegoniates. In our next uh, series of lecture, we will see some other features like development of vasculature etcetera. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much.